Our next guest is Eugene Fama, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2013 for his work on the efficient market hypothesis, portfolio theory, and asset pricing. Colloquially known as the father of modern finance, Fama is the Robert R. McCormick Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago. We'll be speaking with Professor Fama about some of the most important themes of the economy today, including inflation, the U.S. dollar, and valuations for stocks, Bitcoin, and gold. Professor Fama, it's an honor to have you on the show. Welcome to Kitco. My pleasure. I'd like to just start by talking about uh, uh, your work and uh, what an honor it is for me personally to welcome you to Kitco. I've been following your work since college. I did my undergraduate in finance at McGill University in Canada. And uh, your efficient market hypothesis was required reading in pretty much every <laughs> single finance textbook that I can still remember and on every single exam that I still uh, care to remember. So uh, huge honor to speak to you finally in person. Well, not in person, but over, over the internet, uh, as much in person as we can. Let's start by defining uh, why it is, or explaining why it is you think markets are efficient, and we'll get into the different forms of efficiency. Um, out of respect for your work, I'll let you explain what the efficient market hypothesis is. It's a, it's a very simple statement. It says prices reflect all available information. Uh, so basically, in that world, it's impossible to beat the market. <clears throat> So that, that's an extreme form of the, of the uh, hypothesis, the market efficiency hypothesis. But <clears throat> the rub is that it has to be connected to some story about what prices should look like. So you need what we call a market of equilibrium. In other words, how do you measure risk? If, if, the, if the market's pricing things correctly, how do you measure risk and what's the relation between risk and expected return? Mm -hmm. So- Professor Fowler. Yes, Ben. I was just wondering, you started collecting empirical evidence and started doing your research all the way back in the late 60s and 70s. Back then, of course, there was no internet. Uh, one could argue early, that it early didn't. 60s. Yeah, early there was 60s. early 60s. My, my apologies, early 60s all the way into the 70s. And yeah. of course, you, you, you've been doing this work for decades. Back then, my point is back then, we had, one could argue, there was less available information to the average layperson as there is today with the internet, with, uh, with uh, access to information uh, more, uh, more uh, disseminated amongst the masses, would you change anything with your uh, research or uh, with your theory if you were to conduct the same research today? Well, I, don't, I, I haven't gone back and redone all the stuff I did in the 60s, 70s, 80s on this topic, but my guess is it would still hold up, for example, the, the main implication that it has for investors is it's it's very difficult, if not impossible, for an investor to beat them to beat the market. Uh, so basically, passive investing is the way you you want to go. Now that that one is, has held up every time anybody looks at it in a serious way. So I think that worked back then, and I think it works today. So none, none okay. of that has really changed. Well, uh, that's, that's the main implication as far as. Uh, investors are concerned. You know, if your if your theory were to hold true, then uh, theoretically speaking, uh, the whole asset management industry would be rather pointless, would it not? I mean, why pick stocks when the markets are already factoring in all available information? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I I don't pick stocks, so it might answer that question is stay away from it and just go passive. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I don't have the credentials to challenge you on your theory, but there are notable uh, investors who, who would challenge you. And I'm just going to quote Warren Buffett in an old article that, um, that uh, was published uh, several years ago. And I quote, I'm convinced that there is much inefficiency in the market when the price of a stock can be influenced by a herd on Wall Street with prices set at the margin by the most emotional person or the greediest person or the most depressed person, it is hard to argue that the market always prices rationally. In fact, market prices are frequently nonsensical. How would you respond to this? What's the evidence? That's a claim, but what's the evidence behind it? I don't know of any. If you could, well, if you could, Observe market anomalies, huge standard deviations from the mean. Would you not? Would you not, at least, ask yourself uh, why things are moving the way they are? No, I, volatility is inherent in in asset prices. 
especially stock prices. Uh, so you, you, you expect volatility because information comes in every day, every minute, every second, and that, that moves prices around from their previous equilibrium values. That's, that's to be expected. So, so volatility is not a sign of market inefficiency, it's just a sign of lots of information coming in, and maybe people's tastes also changing. The risk premium changing into as a consequence. That's a good point. How would you define market anom anomalies then? M market anomaly is very, very difficult to pin it down because you have to tell me what your underlying model is for risk and return. So I can tell whether what you're showing me deviates from, uh, from that. So one thing is there is a market inefficiency that has always stood up. So if you look at insider trades, they make money out of the trades. Insider trading is profitable yes. to, the, to the people who do it. So but that, that's one of the few exceptions to the rule. Now you would expect it would be because they have access to information that nobody else has. Uh, that's why we have insider trading laws. Um, but there's a case where for an insider, the market in the insider stock is not efficient. But for everybody else, it could well be efficient. So in other words, he can make money on it or she can make money on it, but nobody else who isn't privy to the same information can do it. So as far as they're concerned, the market is efficient. Okay, let's just talk about insider trading uh, very briefly since you mentioned. That's an excellent point. Some critics to the efficient market hypothesis would point to insider trading as an example of inefficiencies. Sure, it is. That's an example of inefficiency, but so what? Are you an insider? That's, you know, should you should you behaving as an insider can behave with respect to the stock that he knows about? Now that's very narrow. And in fact, when you look at insider profits on their trades, they aren't that big, but they yeah. are there. Let's let me just ask you a hypothetical question. If the SEC were to make insider trading legal, let's say mm -hmm. tomorrow anybody can do it, there would be mm -hmm. no recourse for this. And all of a sudden, I'm making trades based on information that's not privy to the rest of the market. Would you revise your theory? Uh, no, I agreed when we started that it's not, the market's not efficient as far as insiders are concerned, at mm -hmm. least with respect to their own stock. So okay. you, don't, you don't have to change the law for that one. All right. That one works no matter what. Well, if a, if a fund manager were, were to ask you, uh, again, a hypothetical question, Dr. Fama, uh, if I were to beat the markets, <laughs> what is a strategy I could pursue? <laughs> Theoretically so, speaking, of course. Theoretically speaking, you have to have information that nobody else has, and you have to know what it implies about the price to, be, the price to come. Right. Um, <clears throat> on, the, uh, on the weak form, uh, theory of market efficiency. Uh, the theory states that markets move on a short-term basis more or less randomly, uh, also known as a random walk theory. It's more or less pointless to make predictions on a short-term basis. Do, that, that, do you subscribe that, to this theory? Uh, no, because that, that's that's like a that's the way people talk about it in the fifties, nineteen fifties, you know, a long, long time back when they first started to think about uh, these issues. They thought maybe prices should be random marks. But then they figured out that no, we have to have an expected return on it because people are bearing risk. Mm -hmm. So the and then the uh the modern statement is that price variation around the risk adjusted expected return is random. Um, I think somebody, uh, I, I remember back in my student days, we were wondering, you know, we were back, back then we were young kids and we knew nothing, but I remember reading your work and we were wondering, how is it that market participants could, in practice, factor in all available information? Maybe I'm misinterpreting this somehow, but the theory states that the markets are always pricing in all available information, but in practice, are investors actually doing that? And how would they do that? Well, you can't... <laughs> So you, when, when information comes out, some people will, will uh, evaluate it and trade be, based on it. That will push prices towards an equilibrium value if they are informed traders. Not if they're, they're not informed, it won't, won't work. So the people who have special information are the ones who make the market more efficient, are the ones people who get it, get it first. But the problem is, if you look out at active managers, everybody claims they have special information, and most of them don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if I, if I were an investor, and I, if I were to ask you, well, 
Dr. Fama, I, I like to make my analysis on a particular stock, let's say, by, by predicting future events, by, let's say, I'm forecasting cash flows based on a certain set of assumptions, or I'm looking at current macro conditions, and I'm, you know, I'm making a projection on revenues based on where I think the economy is going to go. Uh, now, would this be a more or less fruitful or pointless exercise, given that uh, much of the theory rests on the fact that markets behave on past performances alone and the markets are pricing in information in the past, right. not the future. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. The market doesn't care about the past. The market's trying to predict what's going to happen in the future. Okay. <clears throat> so your, your analysis of information, macro information, micro information, whatever, that's, that's going to work if you have special access to it or you're better at evaluating it than other people are who already are, are trading based on it. So, you basically have to be better than whatever is already built into the price in the way of future evaluation of future information, or evaluation of current information about the future, not the past. How, how do you feel about technical analysis? So analysts who trade based on just reading charts. A lot of the times, <laughs> this is an extreme example, a lot of the times they don't even know what the tickers are. They just look at the yeah. charts and they, pay, right. and they trade based on price patterns. Well, uh, Merton Miller used to say, I can get you all of the uh, chat readers you want for, for 10 bananas a day, because <laughs> that's what he, how, how, how much he thought about what they, what they actually did. In other words, they're just monkeys, basically. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I, don't, I don't want to be insulting to, no, to no. anybody. Basically, I think that that's a hopeless activity. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So long term, just to sum up, long term, I think uh, for someone to beat the markets, they have to, as an investor, have access to in, to information that may not be available to everybody else. Would that be a fair way to sum up? Um, oh, they, oh, they can evaluate it better than everybody else. Evaluate it better. All right. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the um, other work that you've done, uh, specifically the uh, three-factor uh, model that you've worked on with Kenneth French, uh, also mm -hmm. known famously as the Fama French three-factor model, in which you... Uh, try to price assets based on a variety of, uh, of, of factors. Um, let, let's talk about the history of this uh, development, and we can talk about the five-factor model later. How yeah. did you come up with this? Well, it was uh, the way we came up with it was basically, you know, back in the uh, early '80s uh, when the first asset pricing model came out. Everybody thought this was Bill Sharp's uh, so-called uh, capital asset pricing model. Um, at that point, everybody, that, I was one of the first people to do work in that model. I thought it worked great. And then through time, what we found was the model couldn't explain certain things. Basically, it couldn't explain the returns on small stocks, couldn't explain the returns on so-called value stocks, stocks who have low prices relative to what seems to be their fundamentals. Uh, so that, that's the reason we developed a, an extension of the capital asset pricing model that included size factor and a value growth factor. Mm -hmm. And then would later you, on, we had a profitability factor. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get to that uh, and that the five-factor model, the expansion of that. Uh, but would you be able to comment on, on whether or not uh, over, over the last couple of decades, according to your research, uh, certain factors have performed better than others, let's say value versus growth stocks, small versus large caps? Yeah. yeah well, I haven't, I haven't looked recently, but value had a bad period. Um, uh, for the last 15 years or so. And so the small stocks had a bad period prior to that. I forget the exact uh, time, but uh, basically the problem with, with saying what, what the bad periods imply is that you expect, you expect long, but you expect bad periods because these are risk factors. You think it's a risky, it's a risky tack to take. So you, you expect to lose lots of the time based on these, these, uh, these dimensions of risk. So for all of those things, you basically can't tell whether they were fleeting phenomena or whether they just had long stretches of bad times. Mm -hmm. Well, like you said, I think uh, uh, certain factors have outperformed over the last 15 years. Yeah. Do you think value and growth stocks behave in cycles or certain cycles in which value outperforms, growth no. stocks outperform? No. We're totally unpredictable. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, you have since expanded the three-factor model uh, to five factors, which includes profitability of certain firms, 
and the yeah. investment, uh, diff the, the, the difference in returns of certain investors, um, those that invest conservatively versus those that invest more aggressively. Uh, why did you choose to expand your factors? Yes. Well, it seems that if you want to go back to a, a kind of a really loose theory, those factors would, would play a role. So if a firm does, if a firm has the same price as another firm, it's much less profitable. Then you think that somehow the more profitable firm is, is more risky. Uh, and the same with the investments. And so we thought maybe these dimensions would help explain uh, the, the problems that the three factor model was having, having explaining certain so called anomalies in the average returns. So, what happens with these asset pricing models is uh, going back to the CAP M, which is the original uh, one that Bill Shock got the Nobel Prize for. It was an incredible uh, feat of research that he accomplished with that model. And it looked good for a while, but then it, it had started developing so-called anomaly, things it couldn't explain. <clears throat> the same thing happens in the three-factor model, and it'll happen again to the five-factor model. So you basically never have a, a full picture of, of what, what, what determines the full spectrum of expected uh, returns. Mm -hmm. Well, does it not stand to reason, Professor, that the more factors you add to this model, the more predictive power this model would have? At what point would you stop adding factors? So, well, yeah, your goal is to do it as few as possible, not as many as possible. So you, you, want, you want a parsimonious model, one, one that doesn't have a lot of risk factors. And you want it to be robust in the sense that it, it doesn't go away with time. So these factors are always there, Sometimes the premiums are positive, sometimes they're negative after the fact, uh, but <clears throat> the phenomena are always there. So if it's just a transitory thing, then you're not, you're not really interested in it. All right. And um, does this model work for all markets, emerging, developed, all countries around the world? Well, people have, the, people have applied it pretty much everywhere. And okay. it, it, you know, it kind of works to the same extent. Uh, everywhere. So the question you're raising is, it's a really good question, is how do you, what do you, do, what do you decide at the market when you do these kinds of tests? Is it just U.S. stocks? Is it U.S. plus the rest of the Western world? Does it include Japanese stock? How, how much do you explain, explain the set of available investment alternatives to test the model? Right. That's a good question, and it's not one that's answered very well in the academic research. Well, I, I'm curious as to what your answer to the next question would be. Uh, the whole asset management industry, it, it seems, is based on the uh, assumption that assets are not fairly valued. At a certain point, things are undervalued and or overvalued. And if you think that things are undervalued, you should buy that asset. Um, when somebody says to you, Dr. French, I think that something is undervalued, um, what exactly is that person referring to, and how does that relate to the efficient market hypothesis? <laughs> you're, you're asking the wrong person because I don't <laughs> think it's possible to do it. What it tells us, right. you're probably wrong. <laughs> but you can't really tell what things are over and under value. If he could, he'd be a lot richer. But it does stand to reason that the entire market is based uh, on on this exchange, right? If if I were buying a <laughs> stock from you. I'm thinking this is undervalued. You're selling it to me. You think it's overvalued. If everybody thinks everything is just fairly valued all the time, there would be no such exchange, correct? No, not at all correct. So I believe in that. I believe in that strongly. The market is efficient as far as I'm concerned. So what does that say for my investing? Well, I still hold lots of stocks. I just hold the market portfolio. I see. So I think stocks have higher expected returns than bonds. So I'm willing to hold, take the risk of the stock portfolio. Mm. And, and hold it, but, but I think the, both the stocks and the bonds are correctly priced. I just think one has a higher expected return. So, so if you don't have to think the market's inefficient to, uh, to to buy different assets. When you go to the grocery store, do you think things are mispriced? You still eat, right? You still buy them, you eat them. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, okay, going off of that analogy, yes, I would go and buy something at the grocery store if I think it's fairly priced, you're correct. So I guess markets are efficient no, no, according go ahead. Go ahead. Markets are efficient according to your research, but some mm -hmm. investors are just more right than others because if I'm buying it from you and the stock goes yeah. up, technically I'm more right than you are, right? 
on that case, but you know, on, on average, it's going to go going to go against going to go against us randomly. So, mm -hmm. all right. Um, what about what about what's so called black swan events? By definition, things that you can't foresee. Um, we saw an example of this two years ago with COVID. One could argue that the markets did not foresee this event. Um, it, it, are such events priced in at any given time? Well, the, after the fact, they are once, once the information comes about. So I, I wrote my thesis on this actually in 1962. Uh, so basically, it was that the uh, distribution of stock returns is way too fat tails. There are too many extreme uh, returns, both positive and negative. And you get these, uh, they call them black swans now, that's a new name invented, but they've been there forever that you have these outliers uh, based on information that happen occasionally. Um, so the, there's nothing new about that. All it's right. a phenomenon that you face that they, at some point in time, almost for sure, there's going to be a big event one way or the other that pushes prices a lot. Okay. I'd like to turn the conversation now towards, I guess, the future of money, if you want to brand that topic that way. Um, the, dig the digitization of our money is a theme in the 21st century, or even the later part of the 20th century. Um, I'm just going to read a quote that uh, uh, you said um, in another interview or media appearance about Bitcoin. You said that Bitcoin is not a store of value unless it has some other value. The core value has to come from something. It comes from its use as a unit of account in transactions. If people decide they don't want to take it in transactions, its value is gone. I don't get what people def who defend the censorship resistance are talking about. I guess that for a drug dealer that has a lot more value, but otherwise, I don't see the big value about that. So, um, let, let, what, what, can you expand on that? So you don't think Bitcoin has any intrinsic value? Well, it depends. So if people use it as a medium of exchange, in other words, they actually conduct transactions in it then it could have value because then it is a type of, of, of money. Uh, but, well, it's a unit of account, it's not really a type of money. You know, it's, it's, just a, it's just a word, right, that we, we can give value to because it's used in, in transactions and it's limited in supply. So in that case, it can have value. But the question is, will people transact in a medium like that that has such a volatile value? In other words, what monetary theory says is a unit of account doesn't survive unless it has a state, fairly stable real value. In other words, its real, its real price can't be going up and down dramatically. And that's not Bitcoin. Bitcoin is all over the place in pricing. So I don't think it can survive as a unit of account. And then it won't have any value. So if it doesn't survive as a unit of account, it's not going to have any value. And okay. if, if people who invest, if people say they're investing in Bitcoin because other people are, watch out. It, does, it's gonna crash. It, it is a very deep question. A lot of people are, have argued with you that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value for exactly the reasons you've just stated. But let me ask you no, this, okay. Professor. Why, why, why is it that it's worth, on paper, worth $21,000 a coin USD today? What, what is the pricing mechanism behind that number? I don't know, but... I don't, I don't, I don't, so I don't, I don't think, and I'm not sure that this isn't, I hesitate to say it, that this isn't a case where the market hasn't figured out that this thing has no value. I see. You know, we, we had a crash recently, right? I mean, all the prices of these things, some of them have died. So some of the lesser ones have, have died and Bitcoin went down to less than half. So in the future, I think I would expect that to happen again. Unless something happens to make its real value more stable. And so people are willing to transact in it. Okay. But now, Unless... at the moment, my guess is even the crooks don't want to transact in it and hold it. They'll, they'll probably transact in it, but then give it up quickly for something else because it's just too risky. Right. So, unless something happens to make it more broadly accepted and adopted, I understand. Well, let me just ask you this if I were to offer you Bitcoin as a form of yeah. transaction, would you would you accept it? Would you would you would you replace, let's say, your fiat money in your wallet with Bitcoin as a form of exchange, willingly? Suppose I'm a business and you, you approach me that way. You want yeah. me to take Bitcoin, and I say to you, look, the problem with Bitcoin for me as a business is it can put me out of business in the sense that you give it to me and tomorrow its price goes down by thirty percent and my margin is only ten percent. So 
I'm out of business basically because I took Bitcoin. Not because I did anything in my business that was wrong. So you, that, that, this is just basically a, a, a statement of some principle from monetary theory that says you can't have a unit of account like that. It's not going to survive. It's okay. Very, very, too variable. So uh, <clears throat> some people would define the money as having, yes, some of these principles you've mentioned. Uh, has to be a store of value. has to be a unit of account has to be a medium of exchange. So we've talked about uh, the medium of exchange and unit account aspects. Uh, what about the store of value aspect? Some people would say that if you if you look at Bitcoin uh, over the course of its 13 year history, if you had bought, let's say if you had bought it 13 years ago, you'd be you know very, very rich by now, depending on how much you bought it at the time. As a store of value, it's beaten other asset classes over the last decade or so. How would you respond okay. to that? It can't be, a, long term, it can't be a store of value unless there's something that gives it value. That isn't just people who are willing to hold it. It has to have something in it intrinsically useful to make people willing to hold it. Otherwise, that whole story, it isn't, it won't be a store of value very long. If it's just because people think it has value, that's going to blow up at some point. One could argue that speculation is the utility. Well, <laughs> that's fine. But you know, I think that utility is short lived. <laughs> okay. The speculation can go the other way and then you're out of business. All right. What about gold? Do you think gold is an adequate store of value? Well, gold, gold has some of the same properties, um, in the in the sense that it, it, it's a highly volatile, uh, has a highly volatile price. So, you know, in the in the old days, I guess people transacted more in gold than they're, than they're willing to do now because they have other mediums of exchange that don't that aren't so variable in, in price. So people used to say gold was a hedge against inflation, but it isn't. It's a terrible hedge against inflation because its price is too variable relative to the, relative to the prices of goods and services. Okay. Um, just on that note, I'd like to ask you very briefly on, on inflation. Do you have any thoughts as to why inflation is at the highest level in 40 years and what can be done to fix this problem? Well, um, that worries me a lot, actually, because yeah. way, way back when, when the Fed started doing this, quantitative easing business, I said, no, they're out of the business of controlling the money supply by controlling the amount of uh, lending that banks can do because of limits on their reserves. Basically, reserves are unlimited now, and they're paying full market interest. So I don't know what's determining the price level anymore because what monetary theory says is you have to have something that has an opportunity cost relative to other assets and is in limited supply. And that's not the case with uh, with reserves anymore. So I've been waiting for inflation to come along to see what would the Fed do. In the in the old days, what it would do is contract the supplies of, of, of reserves so that it would get some control over the price level that way. But now it thinks it can do it by raising the interest rate on reserves uh, and making people uh, less willing to hold hold them to hold other assets in them to do anything else because of the higher interest rate. But then the question is, how high does that interest rate have to go? So, Well, that's a good point. In the 80s, Volcker raised it to double know. digits to match inflation. So right. if we were right. to be Volcker-esque, we'd have to get inflation, uh, the interest rate up to 9%. Yeah, well, right. I remember that time very, very well. So that's right. So really, people have been shocked that they, they pushed up the federal funds rate from zero, basically, to 75 basis points. But if you're running 8% inflation, 75 basis points is nothing. You know, you gotta, as you said, you got to get up there. You got to get that rate up to near 8% to make, to make it work. Maybe. Who knows? This regime never existed before. We don't know if it'll work at all. If yes. you have any, any clue, any way to get hold of uh, to control inflation. We really don't know that. And they don't know it either because they, they've never had to do it before. So are, are you insinuating, and please correct me if I'm, my assumption is wrong, but are you insinuating that the Federal Reserve's efforts right now are in vain? We don't know because this is the first time anybody ever tried to do it this way. They had to come out of this quantitative easing business by, and raise interest rates to try to control uh, inflation. No, we don't know whether that will work or not mm -hmm. or how much... How much, how much higher interest rates have to go to make it work. We just don't know. 
Well, to, to fight inflation, we have to get to the cause of inflation itself. Would you agree with monetarists like uh, Milton Friedman, who, who have said that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon and that it's caused by increases in the money supply? <laughs> no. Um, well, here's the problem with that. See, Milton was, Milton was right in his time, you know, in the way money, money was defined in those days. So in those days, you had two forms of money, currency and reserves. And reserves and currency were freely exchangeable, but the reserves didn't pay any interest. So they were just like currency, uh, basically. But then when they started to do this quantitative easing business, they said, people want, if we put in $3 trillion worth of reserves, when formerly we only had a couple hundred million, what will people do with these reserves? They won't want to hold them. So we have to pay interest on them. So now the opportunity cost of holding reserves went away. They pay fair market interest. Uh, and that, what that means is there is no meaningful concept of a money supply out there anymore. It's basically elastic. Okay, but, but you could observe a correlation just in the last two years, for example, increases in the M2 money supply, increases in the central bank balance sheet, the expansion of the balance sheet, rather, and, and CPI. Uh, no. Is that just a correlation? It's not a causation? No, well, if you go back, what you're going to see is um, they've, they've been... They've been lucky. So to go all the way back to uh, 2010. Okay. When the, when the interest rate first hit zero, and then and they went into this quantitative easing um, business. Well, they, they, the reserves went from a couple hundred million up to three or four trillion dollars. Nothing happened to inflation. So according to the monetary theory of inflation being everywhere, a monetary phenomenon, we should have had a hyperinflation. But we didn't because those reserves paid interest, full interest. There was no opportunity cost to uh, holding them. So they had basically no effect on inflation. But then what you didn't know is what we're facing now. What happens if you do start getting inflation? How do you get out of it? That's a question that has not been answered. Right. Well, again, hi I'm hypothetical. I have I know I'm not saying I have the answer. I don't know what it will, will take to, to, to pull us out of this. If you were Jerome Powell, what would you do? Get another job. <laughs> I should be so, I should be so quick. I don't think he knows either. I'm sure, in fact, I'm sure of it. He does not know what it will take to control inflation at this point. He talk all about right. it all day and give a lot of speeches, but there is no experience in this regime that we have now. Uh, you're right. It has been uh, uh, unprecedented what is going on. Another concern on the flip side of inflation is the dollar. People are concerned about the U.S. dollar losing, uh, not only losing value per, per the inf definition of inflation, but also losing its status as the world reserve currency, as the number one hegemonic currency in the world. Is that a concern that you share? Well, uh, that's, that's overrated in the, in the sense that what does it mean to be the reserve currency. All that means is uh, international prices get stated in your unit of account. It doesn't mean that anybody actually holds your unit of account. They just state prices in that unit of account for inter international transactions. So it's not really a reserve asset or anything in that sense. It's just a word that's used. It's just something that has value and it's exchangeable for other things that have value, but nobody actually holds it that is in a US citizen. Nobody actually holds the currency anyway. But so that, that doesn't that doesn't bother me. But my my, my comeback question would be what's gonna replace it? Potentially you know, a uh, sorry. Everybody else around the world's going through the same problem, right? Inflation's gone up to eight percent basically everywhere. So everybody's facing the same problem. The dollar's been getting stronger in the past few months because relative to Europe, we we're, we're better off. We don't have a war in our doorstep. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have any thoughts on a central bank digital currency? This is a relatively new development. Some central banks are working on it already. Um, the Federal Reserve being one of them. <laughs> this is what they're using words sloppily is what it comes down to. So I jump on everybody that comes, comes to Chicago and gives a talk, talks about the, the Fed coming out with a digital currency because I say they've always had a digital currency. That's what reserves are. They're a digital currency. That's all they are. They're just entries in a bookkeeping and in a computer. And then the, 
the trading takes place in those in those entries and they clear at the end of every every day. So I said, so what is this new digital currency you're talking about? Well, they say, well, now we, we want to give let everybody have access to the clearing mechanism of the central bank. Well, that's a different story. It's not it's not a new digital currency. It's a new way of access conducting transactions. They're misnaming it by calling it a digital currency. They already have a digital currency. It's called reserves, but it's just traded by but only the banks trading. You know, you and I can't go in and trade trade reserves. You have to go through the banks, and they have these slow, these slow systems of, of clearing the transactions that people are really sick of at this point. It takes you two days to get something to get through the through the system. It should it should take nothing because it's a, just an electronic transaction. <clears throat> the worry so, is that the government can now track your spending and perhaps even control your spending directly by limiting the, num the, the transactions you make given, um, I'll give you an example. Suppose, this is just a hypothetical example, suppose we were to have um, some sort of curfew because of the pandemic or whatever the case may be, <laughs> I could say to you, me being the government, I could say to you, Dr. Fama, you cannot spend your money after 10 p.m. I'm going to lock right. your account. Right. Is that a, is is that just yeah. is that just talk? Is that no, overblown it, fear? No, no. Well, it, I think it is the case. I I've, I've not heard that one explicitly, but it is the case that if we have one ledger, one computer ledger that has everybody's transactions, in, you know everything about everybody at that point. That is true. That is one downside of that uh, system. Right. But that potential exists right now with the with the banking system. Of, of, of doing this thing. If you can get access to my bank transaction, you, you know everything I've ever done, basically. Yeah. So but having it all in one place that the Fed has a big computer that everybody transacts to is uh, makes that an easy game for the, for the Fed. So you, you, have, you would think that, I don't know how they would develop rules to get around that problem. I haven't thought about that. Mm. I'm going to close the uh, conversation about markets on this question. I think uh, a lot of people would be curious to what you were, would say, given your decades of experience and, and your contribution to modern finance, Professor. What are the biggest risks or themes today th that you're observing in the marketplace that maybe didn't exist 50 years ago? It's a good question. So well, I think what we're seeing now is that the world has become, I mean, just in the past couple of months, what we've seen with the war breaking out in, the, in, the, in, in Europe is that all the economies of the world, all of the, all of the economies of the world are basically linked, linked together much more than they ever have been in the past. And as a consequence, when you have one bad player, Russia in this case, does something extreme, they can disrupt the whole system. So that, that's perhaps the sole cause of this 8% inflation that we're seeing uh, around the world now. But, so that, that's the, uh, the risk that we haven't taken seriously until now, and I think we have to deal with going forward. How do you deal with the potential of a rogue regime to upset the whole car? Now, it's really, if you think about it, I mean, <laughs> every economist would say, Trade is better than war. Trade is better than war, always. You can always make people better off by trading than you can by attacking them. Now, you can make yourself better off by trading than attacking them. <clears throat> because you're making the pie smaller when you attack them. It's, so, it, 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 but, yes. but still, we do it. I mean, the humans don't seem to be able to progress on that point. And to stop attacking each other. You don't seem to be able to do it. Is it is it true now that like you're right? You're absolutely right. There is a lot of interconnectedness in the global economy, and people have uh, noticed that. And I think some politicians around the world are addressing this issue by being more protectionist. Is protectionism the solution to the problems we have today? I don't. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. That. I, I don't. I would not claim an answer on that. I don't, right. I don't know. The, I don't know that protectionism is the, is the answer. Certainly, the world. Without wars, the world is better off without protectionism. The world is better off being a free and open place where people can move around and go to the places that work best. Um, and that, that creates competition among political systems then. Uh, so 
But well, little, you have, you have to go to a little of war before you can do that, you know? I, I'm not arguing for more war. I'm not saying we should have more war. But one one could say one could argue, Dr. Fama, that uh, World War II was uh, the, a hotbed for innovation and in technology, uh, war spur innovation like no other time period in human history. <laughs> yeah, you, do you think that makes up for the destruction they caused, though, and the number of deaths that go with it? True. That is the downside. That is the trade-off. I don't. I don't think if you were Jewish, you'd take that stance. All right. Finally, what is uh, your advice for somebody seeking a career in finance today, uh, a younger person wanting to study economics and finance? How should he be successful? How should he be knowledgeable like yourself? Well, uh, basically, what I, what I say to every young person is, find something you really like to do, because you're gonna, you're gonna spend at least a third of your life working at a, at, a, at a job. So you'll sleep a third of your life, you'll work a third of your life, and you have another third of your life you, you, you do what you want to do. But if you enjoy your job, that is the best possible life you're ever going to have because now you're basically all your, all your, all your hours are, are spent in a way that, that uh, satisfies, satisfies you. So set, find, so this is my, my exact recommendation. Find something you love to do, but make sure not too many other people want to do it. <laughs> because then the price will be too low. And have you and have you personally enjoyed or loved your career? You've your contribution to finance is indisputable. You're a laureate of the Nobel Prize in economics. Any regrets you've had? Ah. Uh, not really. It'd be pointless anyway, but <laughs> I, I think I've been incredibly lucky actually. So from the very beginning, I'll, I'll tell you a story how the luck first started. So I was a, a senior at college at Tufts and I had switched in my junior year to economics from Romance Languages as it was with my major. Uh, so I was thinking of going to graduate school. I wanted to go to a graduate business school and my economics professors at uh, Tufts, oh, they all love me. They, they told me to go to University of Chicago because they were more oriented towards you know, uh, basically uh, theoretical kinds of e economics and other, other subjects. You don't go to the Harvard Business School. And we're all graduates of Harvard. So I applied to Chicago and I never heard anything. Mm. So finally, it came to be April. And I said, boy, I should have heard from them by now. So I called and the dean of students actually answered the phone. Nowadays, he wouldn't even have a phone, it'd be too important. But, <laughs> He answered the phone and we chatted and he said, well, frankly, I don't have any record of your application. And they said, what? but how are your grades? And I said, basically all A's. And he said, well, we just happened to have a scholarship of somebody from Tufts. Do you want it? And that's how I ended up at the University of Chicago, where I've been ever since. So <laughs> there's, a little, there's a little serendipity in that story. You know, you know, could have gone on an entirely different path. A happy accident. And... And look at how many people in finance have been better off because of <laughs> because of that serendipity, Professor. Uh, I mean, you've never looked back. Yes, I mean, you've never looked back and said, "Oh, I should have bought this stock, or I should have made this investment." Look how much it's gone up. I missed the boat. Everyone's missed a boat on something. Do you ever have regrets in that regard? No, I never even look. Pointless, right? <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> it's a good life lesson. All right. Well. Uh, Dr. Fama, it's been an honor speaking with you, and uh, I enjoyed this conversation. I learned a lot personally. I hope we can keep in touch and continue our conversation another time. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, David. My pleasure. All right. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn.